Uh, kia ora tato. Ko Dan Simons toko ingoa. Ke Westpac aho e Mahiana, he senior manager of consulting and insights aho Tina Koto Katoa. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Dan Simons with Westpac's Transactional Solutions team, and have the distinct pleasure today of hosting us on what is the final Westpac Smart Seminar for 2022. The focus of this series being informing you about relevant issues affecting you and your business. To set some context for today's discussion. When we get in our car, it is second nature today to reach across and put our seatbelt on. Um, for most of us, it feels incredibly uncomfortable to drive without one. We do this all with the hope that we avoid any incidents when we're driving, and usually do. Uh, but regardless, in the unlikely event that we do have an accident, we trust implicitly that that seatbelt is going to be there to keep us safe. So we always wear it. It's second nature to put it on when we go for a drive. So today we're going to be exploring the importance um, to your businesses of being prepared for a cyber incident. In preparation for this quarter, I've been chatting with my two subject matter experts who I'll introduce in a minute about the persistent efforts, um, efforts of fraudsters and scammers and how we're seeing an increase in the number of incidents and, and probably more worryingly recently an increase in the quantum of financial loss. So we do need to make protecting ourselves and business a priority. We need to start thinking about protecting ourselves from cyber risk in the same way as we do when we go driving. Being prepared for that incident. To continue the driving analogy, always driving safe cars and wearing our seatbelt. Hopefully today's discussion raises some questions you may have. If you do, if you look to your right, you'll see that there's a Slido box to the right of the screen. Um, please enter your questions into that uh, into that area, and we will get to these at the end of the presentation. Also, note that as people enter these into the into the into the box, you can see them and, and vote, so that um, some of the more important questions bubble to the surface, and we can address those quickly at the end of the seminar. Um, joining me for the quarter row and important to this are two subject matter experts. I'm simply the host. Um, I'll give each of them a chance to introduce themselves. So first, um, Sam Leggett from CERT. Hello, Sam. Kia ora, Dan. Kia ora katoa. Uh, my name is Sam Leggett. I'm a senior analyst in the Threat and Incident Response Team at CERT New Zealand. Uh, I have a background in fraud prevention uh, before my time at CERT doing incident response. And for anyone who doesn't know, CERT New Zealand is the Computer Emergency Response Team. So we're a government agency tasked with uh, offering advice and assistance to anyone who is or may be dealing with a cyber incident, whether they're an individual, uh, an organisation or a small to medium enterprise. Um, that is the role of CERT New Zealand. And my role within CERT New Zealand is actually responsible responding to those incidents and offering that advice. Wonderful. Now, kia ora, Sam. And I have also have the pleasure of introducing one of my colleagues, Ray Chow, um, to join us. Uh, good morning, Ray, if you could introduce yourself as well. Thank you, Dan. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ray Chow. So I'm part of the uh, cybersecurity team at Westpac. So, and the key function that I provide for the bank is the cybersecurity advisories. And what we do is the uh, a team of consultants that we work on across the bank, working with our colleagues, uh, across any new initiative, any pro, um, any services and products that have a have a technology elements that we would look at um, look at the any any cybersecurity risk that we need to mitigate and 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 as part of the product and services that we provide to our customers, we need to make sure that they're keeping our customers safe and secure. And also part of our role is also keeping the bank safe. In terms of my background, so I've been in the cybersecurity industry for about twenty years. Various um, various sectors, from government department to private sectors, and my um, and my passion is, is about keeping how I can contribute um, to keep news in the internet uh, internet space a bit safer. Thank you. Over to you, Dan. Fantastic, Ray. Um, as you can see, um, some strong experience both on protecting and responding to cyber incidents from both Ray and Sam. Um, what we'll do is we'll, we'll work through a series of questions that just takes us through raising the awareness and importance of us being prepared uh, in business and, and protecting our business from cyber incidents. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lead off with one of the big questions for my panellists, uh, panellists, and I'll pass this across to Sam first. And the question being, uh, what are some of the biggest cyber risks facing business today and why is it important that we have a response plan when in business? Sam. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So I think um, when we think about the risk to businesses, there's a couple of incident categories or types that come to mind specifically. Um, ransomware being one of them and business email compromise being another. Both these kinds of incidents can pose uh, really significant risk to businesses, operational risk, uh, loss of finances, loss of reputation or reputational damage, uh, loss of customer data, all these kinds of things. And the reason it's so important to have an incident response plan in place prior to these incidents uh, taking place or affecting your organization is to allow really good coordination before 
before, during, and after the incident. So not a lot of time is wasted um, actually trying to figure out what to do and who to call. Um, and having having this incident response plan really nicely uh, defined and uh, clear for everyone, it helps uh, define roles that every person needs to play in the response. Again, it just allows for a, a quicker response, more efficient uh, recovery from the incident so that organizations, businesses can get back to that business operation as normal um, whilst dealing with that kind of incident. It kind of cuts down that time uh, that the recovery takes between the initial detection of the incident and actually recovering and getting back to that business as usual. Fantastic. Uh, Ray, your thoughts? Cool. So thanks, Dan. Uh, thanks, Sam. So just taking, so taking further from, 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 from Sam's point, if you, if you think about pandemic, so how, so every single audience is in, every single business has been disrupted by the pandemic and that has accelerated the change of how you handle your technology, how you use your technologies, how your staff use their technology, how you service your customers. So, and then compound that with all the, um, so all of the common threats that the, uh, that, that Sam has spoken about. So that does, so that does compound your, your, your risk itself. It's, and, and the key thing and the important things of having a cybersecurity incident response plan is just giving you the opportunity to plan out all the different scenarios on what to do. So you're not going to be panicked because in, in, the, in, the, in the event of an incident, so there's so much to deal with. The more, so the more that you can actually write down, the more processes that you can follow. You just, so you're not going to be thinking on the fly. The least that you think on the fly, it's just going to be allow you time to think on what's the most important thing. And for Westpac, we're the same. So we have cybersecurity incident response plan that cover, so cover many scenarios. And also just like everybody else that we does covers pandemic, but we haven't covers to the magnitudes that what COVID has actually brought to us. But the key thing is that it's not just having the plan, but it also having having the plan to be regularly regularly tested and also reviewed and make sure that is current. If you think about the cybersecurity incident response plan as your health and safety, so I'm sure that many businesses, all the businesses will have your health and safety plan. Just think about that as your your health and safety plan for your technology. Awesome. Fantastic, Ray. Um, and Sam, I, I think you know that that story of your incident plan being able to help with your return to operations as quickly as possible, so that you're not doing one or the other. You can actually work on both. Is incredibly important. Next question then is uh, alongside having the plan, um, why is it why is it important in a digital world that we actually have a hard copy of this plan? Uh, Sam, what are your thoughts? I think it's really important to have that hard copy um, just so that it's easily accessible by everyone. Everyone kind of knows where it is. They can go and have a read of that. They can familiarize themselves with it. It's not this big daunting um, thing that gets activated in, in crisis um, moments. Um, it's likely that the people that actually need to be using that plan, the ones that are involved in the, uh, the incident response and, and recovery, they need to do so in a quick and timely manner. So having that easily accessible, they can they can run over to the shelf and grab it off and, and they can refer to it as they need to is, is really key. Again, it just cuts down that time frame of, of responding to the incident, recovering and getting back to standard business operation. Fantastic. Uh, Ray, what are your thoughts around a hard copy of a plan? So I would say, uh, so I treat a hard copy of the incident response plan as similar to your civil defence kit or your emergency bag at home where, yes, you know that you've got food in the pantry, you know we're having, but then in the emergency, you're not rushing to everywhere. You just grab the bag, you just grab that plan and then you just follow. So one of the procedures that with our, with our response team, that breaking it away from holidays, so they would grab, so they would have a hard copies that they would be having with them as part of. So we go for rotation of on call. They will make sure that in the event of an emergency, then if they don't have access to the technologies, they have the physical plan that they can refer to. So it's just important that it, you, so you're just managing that possibility of your disruption. So having that hard copy of the plan it should be part of your plan as well. Dan, 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 if I may add, yeah. um, add in there, I think that's a really strong point. One of the things that we talk about in terms of backing up your systems, backing up your data to help uh, recover from a ransomware incident, one of the keys there is to make sure that those backups are stored uh, in a different place to your environment or your servers so that if those servers are ransomed, uh, are ransomware, um, your backups are still accessible in a different location. So I think that's a really strong point that, you know, maybe you're suffering an incident, maybe where you store your digital plan is no longer accessible. That's another great reason why you need a, a hard copy of an incident response plan. 
Yeah, um, very similar to the way we as a business run our business continuity plan. I've got a hard copy of that plan here with an arm's reach, um, just in case I'm I'm not near the physical copy in the office. Absolutely. Um, so so businesses have gone to and listened to this and, and gone through and created a response plan. Um, my sense is then this is a live document rather than a static document. How often should you you know how often should you review that plan and rehearse your response to a cyber incident? Sam, what's, what are your thoughts on, on you know, keeping that document alive, practising and reviewing? Yeah, it's certainly a really important practice to, to be going over that, practising it, actually running through it. Typically, we sort of recommend about uh, practising that response plan every sort of six months. Um, that, that time frame might change a little bit depending on the size and capacity of your organisation as well as the primary risks to your business. Um, having, uh, having those regular practices, again, it allows everyone to become familiar with it, know their roles, uh, what they need to do uh, when an incident actually takes place. It also allows you to make sure that you're recording any updates or changes to your plan as you're going through it you might practice it and realize that you've got a gap somewhere or that you need to make an addition and actually having those practices and going through them it allows you to make those additions as changes as you need to yeah right your thoughts so for so in terms of the reviewing of the incident response plan so so if i if i start with from a westpac perspective so it is a australian and also new zealand reserve bank requirement that we need to uh, conduct reviewed of our plan on a regular basis. So it's a regulatory requirement for us. So I think that's the first thing to demonstrate to the, to the customers is that it's, it's recognized as one of the importance that it's, it's, a, it's a mandatory for us. But in terms of the frequency of reviewing of, of the plan, um, so obviously it, it needs to be working for you. So whether that's six monthly or whether that's annually. So I think adding to that frequency itself, if you have any key personnel that overall part of your plan has changed so it will be good to actually to review that plan or even test that plan so to make sure that so any so any replacement or any any changes in personnel it will be, be familiarized with, with with the processes or if you have any major change to your technologies or your business functions that could alter your plan it will be also a good time to review that if it's going to be a part of your project so you can include it at the end of the of your or as by your project of a major major technology change that hey how do we respond to that plan so for example if you're changing from um from your traditional technology environment having your own um having your own data centers or you host it in-house and you shift it to the cloud that will consider to be a significant change so that you should be planning out and making sure that the plan works in those te to, to accommodate those technology changes that's yeah. awesome, Ray. I, yeah, I hadn't thought of that consequence of you know, that that plan pivoting based on you changing your architecture, your technology, and your and or access points or people. Um, I do, you know, supplementary question that I'm going to insert in here that we didn't rehearse. Um, so is uh, I'm then assuming as well that depending on what industry you're in and the susceptibility for it to be um, attacked or or be viewed as. Um, attractive to attack, that must also start to give you thought to when and how often you review your plan. Is that a fair sort of fair assessment as well? Yep. So I think it's the if we if we look at transfer industry, if we're looking at the medical professionals, that they would be having different different equipment, different people coming in, so they will practice drills. So similar to fire drilled, that changes is going to happen. So it's just going to be having those tests and having those reviews to make sure that it's going to work accordingly. So you what you try to do is you try to proactively manage your stress in the emergencies that you don't have to worry about. Is things going to work? Is is it going to be is that is that going to be working and how? How, how we plan so the best ways there to, to test it out is to simulating those so simulating those tests without any stress fantastic um cyber security there's a very real risk that we view cyber security as a technology problem and a technology solution however i'm um, increasingly what we're seeing in, in some of the data coming out of cert and in research is people are a vital part of being cyber resilient um, great example being the research around passwords and the use of passwords um, what's sam what strategy do you recommend to educate and, and embed the learning with your staff and, and bring your staff on the cyber security journey yeah, it's a, it's a really important point, and it kind of comes back to what we've touched on a little bit, have, having everyone in the organization familiar with the incident response plan, you know, knowing what happens in, in the case that an incident occurs. I think um, a key part of an incident response plan is actually a lessons learned uh, aspect at the end. So uh, once everything's been dealt with, once you've recovered from the incident, you're back to 
business operation as, new, as normal, um, actually reviewing that, what happened, what went wrong, what could we have done better, those kinds of lessons learned um, sessions are really important and having everyone involved in that so that they can uh, offer their point of view, offer their opinions because, you know, different different people in different parts of the business will have different views and different opinions on these kinds of things. So that allows to get uh, allows you to get all those different views and, and collate them as part of that lessons learned. It also makes sure that everyone is involved uh, with that process um, so that not, not just that they're familiar with the incident response plan, but they actually have a part in, in uh, bettering that incident response plan. That sort of brings them along on the journey with you, makes them feel involved with that incident response plan. And, and like you say, it is very much a, a people issue these days, uh, even though it's viewed as, as very much a technical issue. So uh, making sure that they're all involved in that is, is really key. Fantastic. Ray, your thoughts? I think it's a ten spot. So if we, so if you think about, so if we, if you think about, um, a sports team just going into a game. So, so a part of it is so that involves training. So, and then also training is the practice of the plan itself. And then also, okay, so that's it. So the actual emergency happens. So the actual game, and then after the game, they'll go go back to the locker room and then they will have sessions to to replay the game itself to take the learning. And and it's and and then it's important that they understand how they can improve. So it's just it's just that reflection that's going to help you to understand what else you need to do and what other support that you need. So if you so so dealing with any events itself, it's not it's not a it's, so it's so it's not a lonesome journey. So there's plenty of support around you, and and part of it is having this session is helping helping businesses, helping everybody to recognise that. There's sufficient. So there's quite a lot of. So there's a, a lot of government sub support around. So CERT around NetSafe around various sectors to provide the support. So it's so you're not going to be facing those situations alone. So just if you think about the so the 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 involvement of the plan and also the review of the plan as a team spot. So and 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 essentially that made, so there's plenty of material out there to help you. I guess harking back to my analogy around the car, right? It, 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 you can have all the safety features in the world, but ultimately it starts with the driver uh, and mm-hmm. the driver being responsible. Hence, why we train drivers and um, and we try and stay on top of our skill level. Um, all those other things are nice safety nets, but if the driver can manage the car, then they're there to protect us in the unlikely event something happens. Um, Unfortunately, things do happen, um, and and we do have incidents. Uh, you know, and I guess part of this is is talking about you know, what are some of the key tools and resources available for business to respond to or repel a cyber attack. Uh, Sam, I know you guys have got a lot of resources, and it, it's it's your specialty. What what are some of the key tools and resources available to um, you know the businesses that, with, that are listening to this today that they can access and and start thinking about to protect their mm-hmm. business. Yeah, certainly. And I think it's a really good opportunity to mention a couple sort of uh, security practices that every person can take to improve their own sort of security posture. I mean, first and foremost, having this incident response plan is, is one key, uh, especially in responding to an incident. It's going to allow you to know who to contact, know who to call, and not really waste time um, getting to that recovery process. Um, but other than that, every sort of individual person uh, as part of your um, organization, uh, their security posture makes up sort of a, a block in, in, the, in the ultimate building of your organization organization, right? So having long, strong and unique passwords, each of your employees having long, strong, unique passwords across their business accounts is really important. Unique being a key there. Uh, we know that a common attack method for um, attackers is to use password lookup attacks, and that's just basically getting long lists of known uh, used breached passwords and trying them uh, against uh, accounts that they're trying to log into to try and gain access that way. So unique is, is really quite important for your passwords. Having something like multi-factor or two-step verification uh, on your critical business systems is really important as well. Just an additional layer of protection that will keep you safe even if someone does get your credentials, whether that's through a phishing campaign or uh, uh, like the, it's been compromised in a data breach somewhere else, that multi-factor authentication uh, will not only keep you safe, but also alert you to the fact that someone is trying to log into that account. So it gives you a little bit of time to address that. Um, other than that, one of the other key practices is making sure that your software, both operating systems, applications and, and software that you actually use in your business, making sure that they're kept up to date as regularly and as quickly as possible is 
super important as well. Security vulnerabilities are a thing. They do pop up and attackers do use those as uh, intrusion vectors. So making sure you have the latest update is going to ensure that those security vulnerabilities are addressed by the vendor. Um, automatic updates where possible is really powerful. Um, but other than that, you can look at some additional things like onboarding a phishing um, API. Uh, so it's a list of, of known phishing websites that you can inject into your security systems to make sure that anyone within your system can't actually access those sites at all. Um, sort of protect them if they do fall victim and they do click on a link, you might be able to stop them actually getting to the site at all. Other than that, I definitely recommend checking out a number of resources that are available both on um, CERT's website and Westpac's websites. One that I'd really like to, to mention here is the top 11 tips for businesses. So this is a resource that we have on our website that uh, anyone can look at. And it's just basically uh, 11 tips that we see as really critical for your security posture that you can enable and embed in your um, own organization. So definitely encourage everyone to, to check that out. And I believe that we're going to send a link out to all the uh, attendees here today for that one. We sure are, Sam. Um, Ray, uh, you know, it's something, you know, the, the tools, techniques, again, something we, we've got a lot of resources for our customers and, and something we live and breathe on the daily. What are your thoughts around what keys, tools and techniques uh, are available to, to businesses to protect themselves? The, uh, so in addition to what Sam has talked about, so all, what Sam talked about, all the tools, um, so so Westpac deploys similar tools and, and protecting the, the the product and services that we that we give to our customers. In addition to the also all the things that what what what, what Sam has talked about, it's it's it also it's just going to be investment. So if you think about that, mm -hmm. so how can a lot of those products and services already come with security pre-bake. So if part of you thinks that, okay, I'm going to hang on to the services because that, so I'm, I'm, so I'm used to using the services itself. But then additionally that, you have to invest additional security platforms, security tools, to actually protect it. On the other side, that if you're constantly just refreshing your technologies, it will already come with security designed as part of when they're so building it and also designing it. And a lot of the safety features um, it's a shared responsibility, so it's not just you dealing with all. So dealing with all the cyber threats or the attacks out there. So, so the suppliers or the or the or the vendors already doing part of it. So you're just taking a lot of tolls away from you, and also just keeping it up to date, uh, make it a whole lot easier. And then the other thing is, it's similar to buying a car. So it's with a car, so you can actually put in all the safe. I can put, I can put all the additional safety features as an aftermarket ports. But if you look at a lot of modern vehicles, it's already come with um, so come with those safe safety features as we're actually doing things faster or traveling faster, going further. Similar with technologies is that the more that we want our technology to do, then you need to look about. So you need to look at so what's available just to make it easier. So it's not as so you don't have to make it um, as a as a burden for yourself. Yeah, and I think um, yeah, thanks, Ray. That that concept that you've you've we've got a lot of these security features around us that we can leverage through our existing technology is is fantastic. And I think sometimes it's about thinking about it, right? Um, some of these are passive, and, and some of these are active um, protections. But it's looking at them as an ecosystem to protect you, whether they are um, original equipment provided or um, you go off and, and buy them uh, as a specialist solution. Uh, last question uh, that we've got um, pre can for today um, is. You know, if something does happen, uh, if the never, you know, if the like the old saying in cybersecurity is, it's a case of when, not if. As scary as that is to say, um, you know, when something does happen, you know, what? How can we help in the first instance when a cyber attack occurs? Sam, how how can how can CERT help support a business when when the unfortunate does happen? Yeah, so <clears throat> someone makes a report through to CERT New Zealand, the first step for us is to respond to that report with a bit of advice, actionable information that they can actually use to go away and hopefully deal with the incident that, that's going on and recover from that and ideally set themselves up into a, a position where they're not going to suffer that same kind of incident uh, occurring to them again. Um, so that's kind of the first step that we take. But at the same time, it can be quite tricky to know where to go, where to report these kinds of things, which organisation it belongs with. So we also try to play a role where, um, say you report something through to us and it's got an aspect of cybercrime, we can uh, we can pass that report on to the police, uh, the NZ police, to save you sort of a, an ongoing reporting process and make sure that the issue is being dealt with by the most appropriate organisation. There's also some things that we can do behind the scenes. So I mentioned a phishing API. That's one of the services that, that we offer. Um, so making a report to us about a phishing email, um, whilst you may not have fallen victim to it, that can give us some information that we can then use to, to ideally help protect some other people. So there's always, um, there's always benefits 
and reporting whether or not you actually need that advice or that assistance. Um, but I'd say one of those key, key key kind of roles that we play is offering that initial advice to give you a stepping off point, uh, as well as being able to plug you into the most appropriate organisation or agency if we aren't best placed to, to sort of help assist in that incident. Awesome. Thank you, thank you, Sam. Ray, we you know we often get heavy, you know quite involved in when events happen, particularly you know amongst our customers. How do how how can we help our customers when when they suffer a cyber incident? So I think firstly is that the um, so with with cyber incidents so or cyber attack, Westpac also exposed to those um, cyber attack as well. So probably as we speak, that we also face those as well. But it's just that we deploy measures to um, we deploy measures to 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 mitigate those 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 attack um, and then at the same time Westpac amounts out of financial services is one of the critical infrastructure across multiple sectors so we so we do have a regular regular relationship with the national cybersecurity centers and also set New Zealand as well and and I would treat um, uh, certain Z so as um, similar to emergency services so when you have a physical emergency you call 111 so in in, in the event of a cyber so a cyber event that if you unfortunate enough to suffer a cyber event then so i would see so i would say that certainly is going to be your equivalent to your 111 so they are the first point of call that you can so call them up and then so like sense like sam said that they have so they have working relationship with different government department that they can actually help you so just in the event that i think the first thing you need to do is that is um pause for a moment and think what you need to do so and it's similar to any of the physical emergency situations it's going to be very stressful it's going to be daunting but the key thing is stay calm breathe and then pause for a moment and then find out who to call and then you'll be find that if you if unfortunate enough to suffer from a breach you will find the amount of help available in new zealand so it's so it's going to help you to manage that stressful situation and in the event if you also um in, unfortunate enough the subject from a bridge, call Westpac. Call your relationship manager, call our contact centers, then we'll we'll support you. We have fraud team monitoring a lot of the situations, the measures that we can put in to heighten our monitoring and also there's also things that we can do as well. And then also so basically that so there's plenty of support available from the bank. Um, so basically that call certainly is even first. And then the second one will be is calling so calling Westpac at the same time. Mm-hmm. After that. Um, Dan, just to add there, if I may, um, I think Ray's made a really good uh, point there that's actually highlighted the impact and power that an incident response plan can have. You know, those incidents are stressful situations. They can be daunting and terrifying. So having that plan uh, already written out, already set up, means that you can take that breath, you can refer to the plan, and then you've got some direction to sort of help you through that incident. So uh, I think uh, Ray's done a really good job of of highlighting the importance of a plan uh, with that response there. Yeah, I, I was going to comment on the same that your worry is worry is mitigated by steps, right? So if you, you it, it won't stop the worry, but if you've got a plan, you can follow. At least you can act with confidence that you're following a path rather than sitting there trying to figure out what do I do now? Something's happened. Um, we see it um, as do many that uh, in the event of a cyber incident, there's a lot of emotions that are approached with that and. Notwithstanding the fact that for many businesses, they've still got customers coming and seeing them, yeah. so they've still got to keep operating. So yep. you're trying to balance this response against normal operations. You can't just hit pause. Um, you know, it, It's incredibly important to, to look after the customers you've got as well as respond to the event. Um, also, like your comment, Sam, that um, reporting an incident is quite valuable um, mm. in the instance that it, you know, it does help um, sort of identify trends and, and mm. uh, patterns when it comes to fraudsters and what they're doing and, and how they're approaching to help prevent future incidents. Um, we, we seem to have done a, a relatively good job and, and finished on time and equally prom- prompted some rather healthy questions from the audience, which is fantastic. So we'll, we'll switch cadence now and move across to answering some of these questions. And um, the, the leading question one is probably for you, um, Ray, and, and it leans into this concept of passive versus active protection. And the question is, uh, any reason why Westpac is not offering two-factor authentication, current online banking, you have a password only authentication protection? Um, could you um, have a bit of a chat around that, Ray, your response to that? So it is on our plan. So it is on our plan to, to actually underway to to provide the equivalent of a multi-factor authentication functions itself. So because um, then providing a multi-factor authentication functions, it's require a lot of involvement across the team. So because then it's, it's – it, so there's a balancing act between – Man- so make it mandatory to to for for every customers to to 
who subscribe to MFA versus that it, it, it's become an option. And then as part of it is that by providing one of those features, it's, so we need to be, po- po- provide support as well, training, guidance, support. So all, so all, so all of those things will be involved in, 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 in enabling the function itself. So it is coming. So it is part of the features that is being done. It's, it's, it's being looked at and also consider. But outside of that, then you may come across with a challenge question. So essentially that is also a form of MFA as well. So it's just most of the MFA that is more commonly deployed or commonly that you, that you come across with with your a lot of services will be similar to a token or text messages or random code that you'll receive. But with MFA, so with MFA for banking services, there's actually two parts. One is um, when do we challenge you when you're actually logging in and also when you when you carry out the transactions? So how do we challenge you that we need to understand how you're doing something deviating from what's your normal? So there's actually two parts that we need to actually think about in compared to a lot of providers that only challenge you when you actually log in. Thanks, Ray. And I know in one of the links we'll send out, there's um, there's a link through to yeah, how some of the protections we have in place, like Online Guardian and, and some of the other solutions, which are some of those passive protections in the background that reference things like you said, where there's a abnormal pattern or an abnormal transaction, it will challenge you to um, answer some challenge questions before you can proceed. Um, but uh, increasingly, uh, it's fair to say, uh, MFA is becoming a feature of my life every time I log in and uh, I have to get my um, MFA password out of my authenticator, like many do today. And it's a good practice to have. Uh, the next question, um, and probably one that's applicable for most of the businesses, and I might throw this one over to you, Sam, because I know your um, quarter three report was just out yesterday. Uh, the mm-hmm. question is, uh, what types of attack are on the rise? What, what, what are we seeing out there at the moment that's that's growing and, and, and dominant in the cyber incident space? Uh, yeah, uh, great, great question. And phishing uh, remains the number one most reported thing. So uh, people are receiving phishing emails. Uh, there's also been reports of brands being used um, that, that can obviously have reputational damage. So it's looking at how you can actually protect your brand. And um, that, that can often be quite difficult. You find that a phishing campaign uh, is using your brand um, to, to sort of send these emails out. Um, what do you do? Basically, you look at messaging out to your customers, letting them know that it's genuinely not you and kind of front footing uh, that issue. Um, that remains the, the number one reported uh, incident for organizations and has been, I think, through every quarterly report we've done. Um, but looking at uh, other things aside from that, I think business email compromise is probably uh, the primary one for businesses to really be concerned about at the moment. Thankfully, ransomware actually saw a decrease in our latest quarterly reporting. Uh, touch wood that that remains that way because that can be really damaging. Um, but business email compromise Compromise can have a few different sort of flow on effects. Um, your email address gets compromised that might result in an invoice being altered and then sent out to your customers who then accidentally inadvertently pay the scam without realizing. It might look like a gift card scam where uh, someone high up in the organization has had their email compromised. They're emailing someone else in the organization asking them to go out and buy some gift cards as sort of a, a reward for employees, things like that. Uh, the scammers get the codes off those gift cards and then, then they're away with them. Um, so business email compromise it can lead to a few other things. Um, think about the kind of information that you have in your business email account as well and what scammers or attackers could use that information for accessing other parts of the business accessing other um, other users and email accounts and things like that so um, I'd say that that's probably the one that is increasing the most and also having the biggest increase in impact so financial loss uh, that, that that we see as an effect of uh, things like invoice scams uh, that seems to be going up in the amount of uh, loss per incident so um, yeah business email account compromise uh, I think is probably the key one to look out for. Um, get that MFA on your business email accounts and make sure those passwords are long, strong and unique. And I guess what you were talking about there, Sam, with both phishing and business email compromise, it harks back to that question around why it's really important to take your staff on the journey, right? Because they are Certainly. they are staff initiated um, sort of situations, right? Where people are, you know, someone's receiving a phishing email or a text, or someone's receiving an, a business email that looks legit but isn't, and that's why it's important that your staff uh, remain security vigilant on the way through yep. this process. Yeah, um, and now, lottery to either of you who can answer this one the fastest. Um, the question is, and again, quite a popular question, and I think one we grapple with both personally and at a business level. And the question is. Yeah, you know, and today, how can we verify a website is genuine versus a fake one? How, how do we navigate that world? Um, who wants to grapple with that question? 
Yeah, I'll, I'll take a crack at it to start with and then I can add if there's anything I miss. Um, it's a really good question and it can be really difficult. And actually, one of the things that we've seen in more of a uh, personal reporting space rather than organisational reporting space is a lot of scam retail sites, especially in the lead up to Christmas. So these are sites that uh, try to mimic a brand really closely and they do a really good job. The sites themselves, the homepage looks you know pretty much spot on and the web addresses are very similar. Um, often they're trying to mimic that .co.nz top level domain with some something like um, uh, NewZealand.com or, or NZ.com, something like that. And so they do a really good job of setting themselves up to look genuine, and it can be really tricky to tell the difference. Um, it used to be the fact that you would look for the HTTPS in the top left-hand corner of the web address, and that would kind of give you a sense of security. Essentially, what that means is that anything that you send to that website, that traffic uh, to the website is secure and is encrypted. It doesn't mean the destination of that traffic or of that information or data uh, is a genuine destination. Right, So um, no longer can we really use that as a one-stop shop, uh, which leaves us in a bit of a really tricky position to, to sort of verify uh, websites and, and whether or not they're legitimate. One thing that we often do at Cert New Zealand to kind of look at this information is uh, something that we call a whois lookup. Um, and you can simply Google this. It'll give you all the information that you need on it. But essentially, you pop in a uh, website domain or an IP address for a website, and it'll give you a little bit of information about when that domain was registered, who's it's registered with, and things like that. That and you can use this information to look at, okay, well, if this website was only registered a month ago, but this business has been around for 20 years, that probably doesn't really track uh, uh, too much. That, that doesn't make too much sense. So that's a, a good sort of red flag. Um, if we're looking specifically within New Zealand, one of the tools that we can use is the company's office. A lot of time, a business registered there will actually include their website uh, as part of their registration there. So having a look at that site, uh, making sure that the website you're trying to access for that business is the same as what they've got on their, their company's office page is another good tool. Um, but other than that, just looking for um, uh, suspicious things on the website itself. You know, often those fake sites won't have really good contact us pages. Uh, they, they simply won't have a form that you can use to contact them. They might have an email address and that's all. Whereas a genuine business, usually they've got a phone number, an email address, a contact us form, a physical address, all these kinds of things. Um, looking at uh, spelling and grammar, you know, there's kind of nuanced and, and older ways of looking at things. But if you look at a site and their sort of, their, their blurb uh, is spelled really badly, it's worded quite badly. That's another good indication that, that maybe the site we're looking at isn't too genuine. Um, but I would certainly leverage those things, uh, who is lookups, uh, company's office, and then just looking at the general uh, style, feel, look of the site itself um, to determine whether or not it's genuine or not. Thanks, Sam. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Snopes user. It sounds like I might need to up my game when it comes to checking for legitimate sites. Um, well, I think the old adage also proves true, right, which is if it's too good to be true, um, it probably isn't when it comes to some of these things. And um, I think that that is always a case of that truism always remains the case today. Um, got another question. I might throw this one at you, Ray, um, given um, I know we live and breathe this all the time um, when it comes to data and data sovereignty and, and backups. And the question is, is it is it necessary to back up your data for SME as we're all using cloud-based services, considering the cost for local servers, et cetera? What, what's your thoughts where you're using sort of off, you know, off-prem cloud-based services and backups? I think before we look at the what's the approach to the technologies, I think the first thing is understanding that what data you need to collect because the, if, you, if you think about the spread of the risk and also the cost itself, by collecting too much data itself it, 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 and itself, it's also a form of risk as well. So once you pass that hurdle and then you will determine, so if you, so if you use cloud services, most of the time it's going to be accessible, but then you need to think about your connectivity. So if what happened if my connection to the cloud service is disrupted, then how am I going to, so to uh, access them. So that's, while it's not, it's, a, it's not your cybersecurity incident response plan, but it will be your business continuity plan on how do I continue to operate with those data that we store in the cloud services? Is that going to be critical to, to, to the operation, if it, if it is? What is the alternative if you, can, if you can't connect or if that services is no longer available? So when you adopt any cloud services, the, think about the exit strategy before you choose it. So in the so in case where you need to actually retrieve or exit all the data, then how would you do that? In traditionally stands when you buy something, you think about what's my need. So you wouldn't think about how do I get rid of it. So how, how do I get rid of it? But then for cloud services, you need to reverse that. So you need to reverse the approach to think about how do I actually get my data back? 
and you may so you may decide that based on those critical so based on those risks that you will want to have a subset of data that you can resize just in case of an, in case of an emergency that for example if you use a cloud services to back up let's say a month worth of data but you may want to have a week of data that you actually back up on so back up on locally that you have access so you're not going to be completely leave yourself hanging fantastic um i think that that in that, that sort of concept ray that whilst the data is in the cloud how you access it um, is the fragility of that model is is quite important right that um, depending on the mission criticality of that data um you may want to back up in the event that you lose connectivity with the end source um, here's a good question, and, and Sam, um, I might um, push this one towards you, given the time of year and, and, and the fact you've quarter three reports just come out. And the question is, we're, we're fast approaching a holiday break where it's quite common for many businesses to shut down and, and, and sort of go on holiday. Um, obviously, it's not riskless to do that, and, and cyber criminals don't stop. Um, what should businesses be thinking about as they start preparing their business for the break? Yeah, I think it's um, it's kind of just about being mindful of the of the period that you're going to be closed for, uh, and maybe about how how you would activate any kind of incident response during those periods. Um, it's very common for attackers to actually use uh, timing as a really key weapon for them. So you'll often see that attacks take place take place in the early hours of the morning because people aren't in the office, right? Uh, they take place during holidays and while people are on public holidays and, and no longer there. So I think tying up some loose ends. Uh, around Around any of your kind of security features or posture. So, uh, if you're working on an, implementing two-factor authentication on some of your critical uh, critical um, uh, servers or, or aspects or, or parts of your environment, then getting that uh, enabled uh, before you sort of go away is, is a good step. If you have any sort of passwords that need to be addressed, uh, maybe they're weak or known to be compromised, then addressing those uh, before you go away well as well is really key. Also, talking to um, the players in your space that would actually be activated in an incident response to say, um, everyone needs their time off, everyone needs their time uh, away for holidays with family and things like that. Um, but what happens if, if the worst happens? Who do we call? Who's going to be available to activate? Um, and what will that response look like? So I guess um, even if you had an incident response plan already, tailoring that a little bit to be specific to the holiday period and what that will look like during that time frame is a really good step to take. Um, and then just tying up any loose ends that you might have uh, hanging around on the security front. I think that, that comment that um, some of the key players that would normally be prominent in your response plan may not be accessible during Christmas, yep. could be overseas, could be just uncontactable, right? So yep. having having backups and potentially even backups for your backups through that period is, is quite important. Um, Sam, you, you've done a wonderful job here because it, one of the other questions that's coming through is how to tell me more about the phishing API. How do I access the phishing API? Um, I thought maybe what we might do is um, we will send an email at the end of this, uh, at the end of the session is uh, maybe we'll include a little bit of information about how to, what, where the phishing API can be is sort of observed and how yeah, people certainly. can access that API. Because, yeah, there's a, um, Marie asked the question and a, and a few people have since um, liked that question to promote it near to the top. So we'll cover that off. Now, yeah, the next sure. question, the next question, um, I'll work out, you can work out which of you two answer this because it gets into some technicalities I don't understand. So the question is, um, would using a DNS black hole software like Pi Hole typically use, and I'm assuming it's Pi like the number, you uh, typically typically used for ad blocking be a good method for implementing phishing website blocking? Sam mentioned, if so, where would I find a list of sites to block? So I will so I'll jump in. Um, first thing, it's normally that we use DNS black hole to deal with any direct target attack to organizations rather than using it to mitigate phishing. So because um, the reality is the tools available to us to protect ourselves um, it's also available to the bad guys as well. So, and that's just that's just the nature of um, that's just the nature of, of of the technology. If you think about um, weapons, like that, it's weapon like, like guns. It's available to police and also put available to the bad guys. So it's the intent behind it. So it's just coming back. So in terms of provide, mitigating from from a phishing and blocking, it's 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 where. Um, so instead of using DNS black holes, so you should be considering using a web filtering that will actually help those have better understanding of the grouping because then from a web filtering, they would then provide the different category. And if your business does that, then you would, so you can select as a, as a business, then this is the category of websites that our 
that so our uh, staff member should be using or we should be using, and then it will block the rest. So auto automatically, that that they will be looking for and researching and looking for any of the phishing websites that they would be blocking it. And same goes for your uh, same goes for some of your email so emailed uh, filtering providers as well that can filter out a lot of the phishing sites. Um, and that would then minimize the amount of effort, reliance on your manual effort to do DNS black calling. Thanks, Ray. Uh, uh, now, that answer now makes me clear why I am the MC and not a subject matter expert in this presentation. Um, I think I caught up with about 50% of that, so I'm, I might need a lesson after this. Um, thank you, everyone, for the robust questions. We, uh, in, the, in the respects of honouring everyone's time, we, we probably don't have the opportunity to cover any of the last questions, but um, we'll certainly cycle back to anyone that's asked a question that's unanswered and, and, and come back with an answer. Um, look, I just wanted to say, um, Ray, Sam, thank you for your time. Um, as I just realised, uh, this, this session really hinged on your knowledge and your expertise. Um, for those that are on the call, we will be providing a, a, a recording of this webinar um, after the event, and it will be accompanied by an email with a link to some of the resources. Um, so Sam touched on the 11 tips for business. They also have how to create a cyber response plan. There is also um, uh, a link to the Westpac page on how we protect, you know, how you can go about protecting your businesses and, and how we protect you. Um, so we'll have all of those. Um, you'll see uh, the, uh, hopefully you'll see there's a survey poll to the right of the webinar. Um, we would love you to leave your feedback and a rating. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, equally, um, you know, if you can give us a view of, of anything else you'd like us to talk about in the new year, this is the last webinar for 2022. So on behalf of Westpac, on behalf of CERT, we want to wish you uh, and your family and friends a wonderful and safe Christmas break. Noho mai from Westpac and CERT.